Well, there are three names that are commonly associated with the revolution in Boston. It's the big three. It's John Adams, John Hancock, and Samuel Adams. The truth is that whenever anything was happening on the ground with the revolution, they were either on their way or attending the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. They weren't there. So who do you call? Well, the call goes out uh, to a 33-year-old doctor named Joseph Warren, a widower with four children between the ages of two and eight. Uh, he is John Adams' personal physician. Uh, just a little while earlier, he had uh, his son, John Quincy Adams, had fractured his forefinger on his right hand. They were fearful he might lose the finger, but, John, but Joseph Warren had saved it. Joseph Warren's younger brother, John, would found that that institution known as Mass General. I mean, this is an extraordinary family. And um, he had spent the last year, 10 years, really sort of learning at the knee of Samuel Adams when it came to political activism. And so he, with others, goes over to Cambridge. They calm things down. It's aided by a shower of rain and one, a, a potential disaster averted. A few weeks later, Joseph Warren pens uh, a, the document known as the Suffolk Resolves, which he reads before a, a, a packed house uh, in Milton. And uh, then his good friend, Paul Revere, rides the Suffolk, take, delivers the Suffolk Resolves 300 miles south to Philadelphia. The Continental Congress has just sat. No one knows what's going to happen. No one knows, you know, what. Never in the past have 13 colonies begin to do anything in any kind of cooperative fashion. And this is a radical document. This is a line in the sand. This says, you know, if this continues, we will fight. It's read before the delegates to the Congress, and it's unanimously endorsed. Suddenly, this group is acting together and in an unpredicted direction. And this is a document penned by Joseph Warren. The fall of 1774 and the winter of 1775, tensions are arising as, as, rising as more and more British soldiers arrive. There would ultimately be close to 9,000 British regulars in Boston. I mean, this is just a huge force in a city of 15,000. More as t uh, fights are breaking out uh, at night in the streets, more and more patriot families are leaving uh, the city, fearful of what's going to happen. And by March 5th, this is the anniversary of the Boston Massacre. And ever since that massacre, there has been an annual oration to, to memorialize those who have fallen and as a protest to standing armies. Boston has a standing army of several thousand there. To have this oration delivered is a potentially catastrophic event. But nonetheless, it's decided to go forward with it. The 5th is a Sunday, so it's delivered on March 6th at the Old South meeting. And guess who's going to deliver it? None other than Joseph Warren. 5,000 people are at the Old South meeting by 11 o'clock that morning. That's a third of the, the, the city's population. There are all, the, and every man, every Bostonian, it's, it is reported, has a cudgel in case things get to, to, to violence. There are 40 British regulars in attendance. Samuel Adams makes sure these officers are crowded right in front of where the speaker will be standing. And there's no room to get in through the aisles. And so, in dramatic fashion, Joseph Warren enters through the back window. And get this, it's reported that he is dressed in a toga. <laughs> this guy had a flair for the dramatic. This was a different kind of patriot leader. He delivers this wonderfully eloquent speech. The, Warren's handwritten copy of it is the Mass, at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And it's just fascinating to see this. And, and the best paragraph, as you can tell, is a late insert. You know, you can, you know it's right over there. And, and you know, he's, he's got his toga on. He's got a handkerchief on one hand. And as, as the, the loyalist observers would say, he spoke with that Puritan wine you know, that was known you know, as the claims. And, and at one point, in the middle of a speech, one of those British regulars, in an act of defiance, raises his fist, opens it, and on his open palm are several lead bullets. What does Warren do? Without skipping a beat, he drops his handkerchief upon the bullets. The crowd loves it. He finishes his speech, 
what could, what could have been an incendiary speech, if Samuel Adams had delivered this, this would have ended up in chaos. What could have been was is actually something that took the high ground. And there was obvious tensions, but they got through it. Let's move to early April, 1775. Now, it's getting really scary. Uh, it's, it's so dangerous in the city that by April 18, every patriot leader has left the city, except for one man, Joseph Warren. You know, we've all heard of Paul Revere alerting the countryside that the regulars are headed to Concord. Well, who gave him the order? Joseph Warren, who uh, in the, the evening of April 18, learns of, of Gage's supposedly secret plot to send 500 British regulars on a mission to Concord where they are to, to uh, where the Patriots have collected cannon and other, uh, other armaments and provisions that's, the, that's a lightning strike, very similar to what, to what had happened, at, that incited what was known as the powder alarm uh, more than six months before. And so Warren discovers, learns of this, and he pushes the button that will start the revolution. Not only does his good friend Paul Revere head out, but William Dawes takes the land route across the neck. The countryside is alerted. And then when Warren awakes the next morning and learns that eight militiamen have been killed at Lexington when they confronted the British regulars on their way to Concord. He is able to escape the city. How he got across the Charles River is, is kind of a marvel. He attends a committee of safety meeting. Uh, the committee of safety was operating as the, 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 the organization that was organizing uh, the provincial, what would become the provincial army. And then he makes his way to Lexington where he intercepts, where he's there by the time the British regulars who have made their way to Concord and are now fighting their way house by house back towards Boston, they are now coming through Lexington and Warren is there. And what's now the town of, uh, and Warren was apparently quite a snappy dresser. He, um, uh, it's common, uh, commented on by several uh, observers of the time, and you know he wore these horizontal curls that looked that was very popular back then, and and had apparently two hairpins, you know, holding everything in place. And in the town of Arlington, a British musket ball takes one of those pins out. Word goes, whoa! He hear about Warren. He put himself so squarely in harm's way. That is, you know, this is a different kind of patriot leader. By the next morning, thousands of militiamen have flooded into Cambridge and into Roxbury, where they the become the two centers of the army, almost literally surrounding Boston, which by this time the British regulars have re-entered, and this now becomes a city under siege. Uh, the British Navy, which has a, a very big presence in Boston Harbor, will maintain a lifeline out for the British Army. But when it comes to all of the land, uh, they are pretty much surrounded. The, Provincial Congress, which has been sitting in Concord, relocates to Watertown, so it can be closer to the military headquarters in Cambridge. They elect a new president, 33-year-old Joseph Warren. He's also the leading member of the Committee of Safety, which now operates as kind of the executive branch of the provincial government. I mean, and he's, he literally has to be in two places at once. At one point, the provincial Congress sends him a letter saying, uh, you know, we, we're waiting. <laughs> come over, you know, we cannot continue without you. And, you know, he said, oh, hey, well, you know, he's just trying, he has to be everywhere. Through his personality, he is holding this, this, the, this, the centrifugal forces of this chaotic scene together. I mean, the 90 days after Lexington and Concord are amazing, where not only are, are they trying to create a new army, but there's flare-ups of violence. Uh, there's the Battle of Chelsea Creek, in which the first British naval vessel is taken and burned by colonial forces. And Joseph Warren is there, you know, but he's also attending the Provincial Congress, and, uh, he, and he's also very involved with uh, troop morale. And by June, he is uh, appointed a major general. 